today on Missing Link. What do dinosaurs have to do with aging? Where's the connection between the elderly and chili pods? How do those fiery spices fit in with elephants? And what do those pachyderms have to do with energy conservation? There aren't any links? Oh yes there are, you just have to look really hard. Missing Link. The Longyearbyen Airport on Spitsbergen. Paleontologist Jörn Hurum is filled with anticipation. Together with his assistant, Lynn Novis, he's flying to a place that has captivated him for years. The three square kilometer area he's heading for has already transformed his professional life and made dinosaur experts all over the world take notice. Geologists went there in search of oil and found fossils instead. When Hurum heard about it, he set out to explore the area. How did it come about that such a unique collection of dinosaur remains, some 150 million years old, ended up here? Hurum has been returning here since summer 2006. Even with a GPS and a map of the terrain, it takes a while to find the exact spot. What caused the demise of so many animals all those millions of years ago? And how did they end up in the Arctic? They're lying in one horizon that's about 30 meters thick. So we can walk on this 30 meters and we can find all the bones. Uh, below there's nothing, above there's nothing. But there, there's something peculiar going on. The dinosaurs only lived here for a short period, then disappeared. Did a natural disaster kill them off? Or a meteor impact? The scientists set out in search of answers. One of the first pieces of evidence provides an insight into the distant past of the archipelago. A hundred and fifty million years ago, Spitzbergen looked totally different to how it does today. In the Jurassic period, the island was located further south. It was free of ice and the dinosaur cemetery was below sea level. They finally locate the spot. When Hurum followed the directions of the oil prospectors in summer 2006, he never suspected how involved he'd become with this part of the world. It was sheer luck that the geologists noticed such unremarkable bone fragments and a further sensation was awaiting them. We understood it was something special when he was standing just here and he was shouting, bones, 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 and we were running up the hillside towards this and at once we saw that they are so coarse, that it's so big, chunks of bone, that this is really, really much bigger than anything we've seen in the former days. The dimensions of this creature must have been enormous. So what I think is that the tail starts over here. We got the body with flippers and ribs and vertebra all the way over here. And what you see here is the, the front of the body with all the vertebra. And actually, if it wasn't for the snow, the skull would be here. That we, we know that from last summer, there are pieces of skull sticking out of the rock just under half a meter down here. Until they return, they'll study everything they've dug up at the site in their lab back home and wait for the next excavation period. Dinosaurs periodically lived in the vicinity of Spitzbergen over the course of millions of years. Their corpses sank to the ocean floor and were covered by sediment. Shifts in the Earth's crust have brought them to their current resting place. The bones were preserved due to the unusual composition of the shale, a layer of stone that runs through the entire east coast of Spitzbergen. It's possible that Jörn Hurum will discover more dinosaur species here. Reaching 100 years old is no longer a utopian idea. We're living longer than ever, but at a certain point we reach our biological limits. And what's the connection between dinosaurs and aging? 
mountaineering, bike riding, and the old favourite swinging those hips with a hula hula hoop. That's how many retired people approach old age. But the number of candles on the birthday cake is a good indicator of the crumbling state of our bones that can lead to arthritis, the most frequent site for which is the hip. Up to 150,000 hip replacement procedures are carried out in Germany every year. Dino and Co. 150 million years ago wished they'd had such opportunities. They too suffered from arthritis. Dinosaurs lived to be twice our age, so hip problems were only to be expected. However, their problems lay less with their hips than with their jaws. Any problem in the biting and chewing department could prove a fatal flaw, freeing their prey from the snapping jaws. But dinosaurs couldn't pop off to the dentist or ask for their meals to be liquidized. They just had to get on with things that monster reptiles do best and bite away. Lecce in southern Italy. It was a lucky coincidence that led to the discovery of the extraordinary abilities of the Mediterranean jellyfish, Turritopsis. A dish containing jellyfish was left for days in a lab having been overlooked. The room was too cold for the creatures and they had no food. Under such circumstances they should have died, but they didn't. The scientists could hardly believe their eyes. Instead of dead jellyfish, the Italian marine biologists found polyps. This is the embryonic stage of a jellyfish's development. It was a big surprise. We didn't expect to find such an animal to be able to, to revert the life cycles and so to escape uh, from, from death. Stefano Paraino and his colleagues need to make sure that their accidental discovery can be empirically verified. Their continuing studies always produce the same results. It seems they're dealing with a form of reincarnation. All of a sudden, this small creature has awakened the interests of gerontologists. The British visionary, Dr. Aubrey de Grey, has dedicated himself to this field. His provocative theories on the human dream of eternal life are discussed all over the world. In scientific circles, they are highly controversial. De Grey has a very unorthodox approach. He likes to compare old people to old houses. With regular maintenance, houses can easily survive for several hundred years. De Grey envisages a similar concept for human beings. The essence of his thesis goes like this. The cells in the human body are like the bricks, beams and mortar of a house. With advancing age, there's an increasing tendency for cells to malfunction. This results in the typical age damage. De Grey seeks to systematically fight this process within the cells and thus keep the entire body healthy. One of the main problems of aging is that DNA mutates in the nuclei of cells or in the cell's power stations, the mitochondria. Waste from metabolic processes also collects inside and outside of the cells, inhibiting their function. If we develop technology to remove this these various types of damage, then there is no limit to how long we could live. It's just the same as with a simple man-made machine, like a car, for example. We can remove the rust, we can you know, remove the corrosion and so on, and keep the car going as long as we like. We have cars that are 100 years old, which were designed to live for maybe 10 or 15 years. And we don't have cars that are 200 years old, but in 100 years from now, we certainly will. Repairing humans like machines. It sounds too good to be true. But what would the world be like if we conquered the aging process? Controversial gene therapies could help people live longer too. In an overpopulated world, children would become a luxury. We would have to completely rethink how our society works. Has the Mediterranean Turritopsis jellyfish adapted to eternal life? Stefano Pirano is trying to track down its secret. He has compared its genetic makeup with that of other jellyfish. The result? 
Turritopsis doesn't possess a special gene, but it is able to activate or deactivate the genes that control cell growth at will. This is of great interest to cancer research because uncontrolled cell growth can signify cancer. But Pirino now knows that there's one quality even Turritopsis doesn't possess. These jellyfish are not immortal at all. They are able to revert the life cycle for a certain number of times, but then they eventually die. Uh, and this is, uh, we, can un we, we know that also, because otherwise the oceans would be filled with the, these jellyfish. So it seems this tiny creature can't perpetually repeat its magic trick, and yet it remains a miracle of nature. After all, who else can simply start all over again whenever he wants to? Chili peppers are among the hottest spices in the world. But few people know such peppers have important medicinal properties. But how are aging and chilies connected? Grey hair, wrinkles and lots of aches and pains. For many, growing old is a nightmare. Often we turn to prevention in the form of hair dyes for the grey, Botox for the wrinkles, and other help. But what to do about the aches and pains? Chili. It has three times the vitamin C of oranges and it increases blood flow. That's a benefit to those places in our body where it twinges and the blood reaches only with some difficulty. After just a few seconds, the chili releases its spiciness in the blood, bringing a rosy glow to the cells. It's also said to help with toothache and be a component in reducing fat, a veritable medical wonder. So rather than a Botox jab, chew on a chili. It might at first bring tears to your eyes, but that could be an improvement on having a fixed facial expression. Thai cuisine is famed for its spicy dishes, and chilies are the key ingredient. Regular pepper is no match for chilies. They set off a tingling explosion in our palate. For some, a torment, and for others, a pleasure. It gives food that extra kick. The spice or piquant sensation is another dimension to the taste or smell. Chili peppers are part of the same genus as capsicums, which also include bell peppers, and they originated in South America. Peter Rey doesn't only know about their culinary uses. For years, the physiology professor has been studying the spicy component in chilies, capsaicin. The chili is the undisputed king of the hot spices. The highest concentrations of capsaicin are in the seeds and placental tissue. It sets off certain pain receptors in our body like a fire alarm. The normal function of the capsaicin receptors in our body is to react to high temperatures, that is, painful and damaging temperatures, in order to warn us against things such as hot stoves. Peter Ray is a physician and a kind of detective too. He's been investigating the active component in chilies for many years in the hope of learning from it. Capsaicin is a bit like a confidence trickster. The chili simulates heat in our body, although there is no actual heat. But the sensation of pain is real, and that's what Professor Ray is studying with artificial high-octane capsaicin. You have to handle it with extreme care. It's an ultra-fine powder and just one grain is enough to trigger a severe sneezing or coughing fit and to make your eyes water. <coughs> you can't be too careful with this stuff. Even when diluted by a factor of 10,000, the active component in chili is extremely powerful. Ah. Wow. Mm. <laughs> it's like putting out a cigarette on your skin. Can you imagine it? The test serves to demonstrate the effects of capsaicin. The laser Doppler makes the effects visible. Here we can see the blood vessels before the injection and afterwards. The blood flow has visibly increased, as it would with an infection. The nerves have temporarily receded as well. After the pain has subsided, the affected area will remain numb for a time. 
The same principle is used when impregnated plasters are applied to treat the pain of shingles. It's a problem because initially it hurts for days on end until the desensitization is advanced enough that you can no longer feel the capsaicin and that you eventually no longer feel the burning pain of the shingles, or at least not as intensely. That's really the only useful application of capsaicin for medicinal purposes. But capsaicin is an ideal aid to science, because it can be used to induce pain in a controlled way for research purposes. Diluted capsaicin is applied to the nerve plexus on a mouse's paw. Its pain receptors sound the alarm. The voltage impulses in the nerves are measured. This is how pain sounds. This is music to our ears, because it answers so nicely. Capsaicin directly targets specific pain receptors in the body. Capsaicin quite literally gets on our nerves, and researchers exploit this fact in the pursuit of one specific goal. We aim to explore the mechanism of sensitization so that we have something concrete to offer the pharmaceutical industry in the development of their pain-killing medications. For many chronically ill people, a means of switching off pain when it becomes unbearable would be a dream come true. Thanks to capsaicin research, this dream may one day become a reality. Thousands of elephants live in the savannah at Kenya's Tsavo National Park but their population is under threat from criminal ivory poachers. But what's the link between chilies and elephants? Up face to face with an elephant, something very few would care for. Because although these pachyderms are known to be good-tempered, their weight alone should act as a warning. Farmers in Zimbabwe want to establish a good relationship with a stout animal, but not for altruistic reasons. Elephants are fond of the maize corn in the farmers' fields, and the farmers have tried everything to discourage them, without success, until they tried chili. The thing that makes chili so hot is called capsaicin, and it doesn't seem to delight the sensitive elephant trunk. With so much success, now the weapon only needed a delivery system. Variants included briquettes on a fire or a sort of chili flamethrower. In such a spicy neighborhood, those elephants can't wait to hot-tail it out of there. The Tsavo National Park is the largest wildlife reserve in Kenya. It's renowned for its red elephants, red due to the iron-rich soil. Around 12,000 of the animals live in Tsavo, a third of all Kenya's elephants. But they have many enemies. Until the mid-1980s, over 1,000 elephants were killed every year. Only 5,000 elephants remain from an original population of 40,000. An international agreement passed a ban on the trade in ivory, but elephant poaching remains a serious problem, even today. The rangers of the Kenyan Wildlife Department are on patrol around the clock. Their work is becoming more and more difficult. They have to adapt to the poacher's increasingly cunning methods. The poachers kill their prey silently, and it's almost impossible to catch them red-handed. That's why the rangers are on constant patrol. The park is also monitored from the air using a light aircraft. Pilot Moses Lelisid is heading northwards, a favorite haunt of the poachers. Below him lies 13,000 square kilometers of savanna and 12,000 elephants that have to be protected. And suddenly, they make a gruesome find. Moses Lelisit fears the elephant has fallen victim to poachers. He immediately transmits the coordinates. The poachers might still be in the area. 
wildlife rangers occasionally lose their lives in the dangerous battle against poachers. The rangers use GPS to determine the elephant's exact location. They follow their noses for the last few meters. The victim is a bull. Its tusks have been hacked out with an axe. The rangers estimate that it's been lying here for about two weeks. Since 2008, poaching has been on the increase in Savo National Park. Just last autumn, poachers slaughtered several elephants in one single attack. They hid the ivory not far from the dead animals. The rangers caught and arrested the poachers. They discovered six tusks in the hideout. That's 82 kilos of ivory. At the headquarters of Tsavo National Park, the rangers weigh and document all the confiscated tusks. The poachers earn about 50 US dollars per kilo of ivory. For many African families, that's a great deal of money. Dealers in Asia pay more than double that price for the white gold. The illegal ivory trade is booming. Last year, poachers killed more than 50 elephants in Savo National Park. In Kenya as a whole, it was five times this number. In 1989, the Kenyan government burned confiscated ivory worth almost a million euro. It marked the beginning of the war against poaching. Discovering an unlimited supply of energy is one of mankind's enduring dreams. In southern France, the first ever fusion reactor could make this dream come true. But what's the connection between elephants and saving energy? Solar panels on the roof, energy-saving lamps in the sockets, thermal insulation on the walls. All good measures when it comes to cutting down on power. Despite them all, horrendous energy bills land in our post boxes. If we were elephants, then these bills would be quite different. Elephants are the masters of saving energy. Despite their huge body mass, for moving about, they need a lot less energy than, for example, a mouse. An elephant's stride is particularly energy efficient. They move both legs on one side of their body and then the same on the other side. Almost all other four-legged animals do this diagonally. And it's this that allows the elephants to move forwards without having to raise or lower their body mass more than a couple of centimeters. Of course, when you ride on them, it does seem a bit more. But there again, that's the price you pay for advancement in energy savings. The search for a solution to our energy needs is beginning near the coast of southern France. The facility at Cadarache could soon become famous as the birthplace of the world's first fusion reactor. ITER, the International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor. Though it sounds like dangerous atomic power, it could one day generate electricity using a totally new revolutionary process clean, safe, and with no waste. But at the moment, it's more fantasy than reality, and ITER is just a collection of ideas on paper and a building site. But for people like Norbert Holtkamp, ITER is becoming more tangible from day to day. The German plasma physicist is the head of Europe's most ambitious construction project and is responsible for its timely implementation. If all goes according to plan, the construction will be completed in just a few years a machine that will allow physicists to literally capture the power of the stars. It will produce energy using solar fusion. Even natural scientists are euphoric at the prospect. ITER has already changed the world and it will change the world in future. The ITER project has brought together representatives from two-thirds of the world's countries. And if we're successful, and I'm sure we will be, it will change the world. And this is what ITER could look like a ring of fire. 
In the reactor core, a so-called plasma is heated to such high temperatures that the nuclei in the atom start to melt. This releases vast amounts of heat energy, just like in the interior of the sun. At ITER, the heat radiation will be collected by the massive reactor walls. The huge vessel will have a capacity of 800 cubic meters. But the physicists are not chasing records, it's pure necessity. The plasma within ITER will burn at 10 times the heat of the sun. Higher temperatures are necessary on Earth because the confinement of the material is carried out differently. On the Sun, gravity alone achieves this, and it's a bit easier up there because the Sun is bigger. We have to do it in a much smaller circle that's only about 10 to 15 meters in radius. The confinement requires a higher temperature to achieve an efficient production of energy. Confinement refers to the process in which the hot cloud of plasma is contained within the machine. A magnetic field 100,000 times stronger than the Earth's magnetic field prevents the plasma from escaping. It compresses the atomic particles into a tubular form which must not touch the walls of the reactor at any cost. If it did, the fusion reaction would stop. The fire would simply go out. But such a field can't be generated using normal magnets. It requires superconducting coils cooled to minus 270 degrees Celsius, blazing heat and icy cold side by side, a major challenge for the constructors. The process consumes vast amounts of energy, but ultimately ITER must produce more energy than it consumes, or it would be an expensive failure. A fusion reactor has already managed to produce 15 megawatts of power. Here at ITER, we'll be producing 500 megawatts, 10 times the amount of energy it consumes. ITER is comparable to a coal-fired power station. Some are a bit bigger, some are a bit smaller, but a mid-sized coal-fired power station would have about the same output. That doesn't exactly sound like limitless electricity for all. But the main purpose of ITER is to demonstrate that fusion power is possible. And if it succeeds, it'll be way ahead of other power stations. ITER doesn't produce any harmful greenhouse gases like coal or gas-fired power stations. And in contrast to nuclear reactors, it creates hardly any radioactive waste. Many ridicule fusion research as a utopian fantasy. And it's true that physicists still haven't developed all the essential technologies and components to make a fusion reactor. But that's why ITER is so innovative. In the search for these answers, science might well provide unexpected benefits to other industries. It's true that fusion is on the limits of what's technically possible, but there are many cases where it was like that at the beginning, such as GPS or anti-lock brake systems, or on a larger scale, satellites, which were units that were used in very specific fields for a long time. Then their use exploded. We predict the same thing at ITER. As soon as the technology is mature, it will be produced in many countries and will be readily available. Fusion researchers will need a lot of patience. Even if everything goes to plan, ITER won't be ready until 2026. If the experiment is a success, it will unleash an avalanche of similar projects. Ultimately, it could lead to power stations of unimaginable capacity.